on the diabetic foot. And we're going to talk about access to diabetic foot care. And at the end, I also hope that some people will understand the rationale for prevention and treatment of diabetic foot before we wrap it up. Wrap it up. For this talk, I have no financial um, disclosures. And we're going to talk about introduction. So Europe has been exporting their maladies throughout history, and they seem to be doing it again, but in a new way. Well, my screen has stopped being shared. And... And in the in in the in the past years, infection was a problem. Now illnesses associated with Western living standards are the fastest growing killers in poor and middle income countries. We talk about chronic disease has become the poor world's greatest problem. So what is diabetes? Diabetes simply means high blood sugar. There are two types of diabetes. Uh, are we talking in particular diabetes mellitus? There are two types. There's type one where the body produces no insulin. And this is usually seen in the very young um, from the time of birth. And there's type two diabetes, which is poor response to insulin or insulin resistance. Now, mo most people have type 2 diabetes in our society, particularly in our society, and perhaps even across the world. Um, and this simply because this is a lifestyle um, issue. There is an entity called pre-diabetes, or some people say they have a touch of diabetes. And this simply when you have high blood um, glucose, but the body is still able to produce enough insulin to manage that high glucose. If we look at diabetes um, incidents across the world, we see that in North America and the Caribbean, in 2021, there were about 51 million people affected with diabetes. And you can see across the spectra of, of the world, there, there's, there, are, there are millions and millions of people affected um, with diabetes. If we look right in our region, one in 10 of the adult population is affected by diabetes. And in the Caribbean, the prevalence, diabetes prevalence is higher in women because it correlates specifically with obesity. And here in the Bahamas, we have three major problems when we look at our regional um, uh, neighbors. One, we have the highest incidence of obesity in, uh, in the region. We have the highest incidence of hypertension in the region. And, uh, and yes, we do have the highest incidence of diabetes in our region. If you look at our statistics, about 6.7% of our adults have what we call a touch of diabetes or they are pre-diabetic. And about 9.2% of the population have actual diabetes. So the prevalence amounts to about 16%. And in 2019, diabetes contributed to 41% of the deaths recorded in our country. Let's talk about the diabetic foot, and I apologize for any gross pictures that may offend anybody. A diabetic foot is an infection, an ulceration, or destruction of tissues of the foot associated with neuropathy or peripheral arterial disease in the lower extremity in anybody who have diabetes or a history of diabetes. And so this, 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 this captures a whole gamut um, of conditions. So when we look at the plethora of diabetic feet, we see it happening in so many ways. And some people may think their feet are normal, but we see, we see feet of all different character and characteristics who present with this diagnosis or this definition of diabetic feet. Sometimes it's just a blister and, and that portends a diabetic feet. Or some people present with frank gangrene and that, is not a good sign. And believe it or not, all of these people are local. These are people who presented to uh, institutions in various forms at different points in time. And this is how their feet look at, at the time of presentation. So we're gonna look at a little bit about the di diabetes and its complications and the, diabetes, the dangers of diabetes and the effects on the health. 
Now, diabetes is one of those conditions that affect almost everywhere in the body, okay? We talk about the brain. It affects the brain because some people, in addition to having strokes and transient ischemic attacks, they get Alzheimer's. It affects the heart. A lot of um, most of the number one cause of death in, in the world is cardiovascular disease. Diabetes contributes to that in a certain way. And we'll talk about that in some play, in some way. Diabetes affects the kidneys. And we know, uh, and all of us have or know somebody who is affected by diabetes and presently on dialysis. It affects the pancreas because the pancreas is the organ that actually produces insulin that allows our bodies to absorb sugar. It affects our uh, intestines. It affects our skin. It affects our um, sexual organs or um, and, and it affects our limbs. It affects our nerves. And so diabetes affects almost everywhere in the body. I want to particularly mention the eyes because a lot of people think that, you know, they're going to have their eyes forever. But the number one cause of blindness in our country is due to diabetes. And diabetes affects um, our vision uh, uh, and, and, be, uh, and in many different ways. Um, we get cataracts, we get glaucoma or high blood pressure in our eyes, and we get retinal disease where the, the uncontrolled sugars cause deposits and, and damage to our retina and we lose sight. Like I said, it's the number one cause of blindness in our country. And we'll look at these complications a little bit closer. But I want to pay particular attention to what happens to the feet. And diabetes and complications and its complications are increasing in the Bahamas and, yes, the wider world. It is the most common reason for admission to Princess Margaret Hospital for many years. And it leads the way to longer stays and poor outcomes at the end of the day. Development of complications is attributed to individual risk factors to poverty, yes, to racial and ethnic differences, and the quality of national health care system. 23.6% of diabetics had their feet examined in the last year, and this was a study done recently right here. So you can imagine that if we have 16% of our population, uh, if you if you take a, a wild guess and say 16% of 450,000, somewhere around 70,000 people, and only one quarter of those people um, um, have their feet checked, that means that we're not doing a good job of trying to prevent the problems created by diabetes. Diabetic foot ulceration is important because 85% of all lower extremity amputations, major and minor, are preceded by an ulcer. So what that means is almost 85% uh, of the amputations that were done, somebody had an ulcer. And so it, I guess I can imagine that if we could manage the ulcer, we could somehow manage or reduce the amount of amputations that occur because of those ulcers. And despite the advances in vascular surgery, the advances in wound care, the advances in medical management of diabetes, the statistics have not improved for lower extremity complications. And somehow, somehow there must be another factor um, that, that, that goes unnoticed. One third of the direct cost of diabetes care is spent specifically on the lower extremity. So, so imagine the health budget that is required just to take care of people's limbs. Up to 25% of patients will, with diabetes will suffer from a foot ulcer sometime during their lifetime. About 50% of diabetic foot ulcers become infected, and about 20% of those infected require some major or minor amputation. The thing is, is a lot of this is preventable. The incidence of diabetic foot ulcers range between 2 and 6.8% per year in the general diabetic population, but the lifetime risk increases to about 15%. So let's look at the impact of diabetes and why does diabetes continue to command our attention? Just think about this. 
every 24 year, every 24 hours, there are about 4,000 new cases of, di of diabetes diagnosed around the world. About 800 people die just because of diabetes. We do about 200 amputations just because of diabetes. And we're talking about every day. 120 kidneys are failing or persons with kidney failure are created because of diabetes. We have 55 new cases of blindness because of diabetes. When I started vascular surgery more than 20 years ago, every 30 seconds, a, a, a limb was lost. Now we're down to every 20 seconds. And so we're not, we're not doing a good job of preventing amputations. When we look at diabetes compared to all the other causes of, that people die from, and we see that diabetes, more people die from diabetes and amputation in five years than from breast cancer, from prostate cancer, from lymphoma. And so diabetes, diabetic foot ulcers have a real impact on our life. This chart shows that diabetes ranks in the top 10 globally for causing disability. And yes, not everybody may die, but some people may become disabled because of the effects of diabetes, either through amputation or some other morbidity. But diabetes is related to the top 10% to top of disabilities across the world. So why is diabetes so devastating? And we're going to look at this a little bit closer now. One of the things about diabetes is because we have high in, a high blood level of glucose, the body have to deal with this glucose because glucose is the energy source for the body. And if you give the body a lot of energy, it will do whatever in its power to, cons to preserve and conserve that energy. And so... Once all the cells have reached their capacity to manage this energy, the excess glucose has to be managed. And so what the body does is it shunts it into a different pathway to be dealt with. And this pathway is destructive to our body. One of the main things that are affected first is the nerves from this abnormal glucose or product or metabolites from this glucose, abnormal glucose pathway. And this abnormal glucose pathway not only produce abnormal metabolites, but it causes what we what we commonly call dyslipidemia. You get accelerated buildup of cholesterol, and it becomes abnormal and is deposited in the normal places and cause the the places that it that it deposited to become dysfunctional. 50% of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes have nerve damage. And sometimes the patients are symptomatic really before they get a diagnosis of diabetes. We hear people complain about burning in their feet or they have loss of sensation in their feet. Height and stable glycemic control is probably the most important way for slowing the progression of neuropathy. Now, there are three sets of nerve pathways that are affected. First is the autonomic nerves. And these are the nerves that do things that we really don't think about on a daily basis. You know, the nerves that keep our skin moist or uh, 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 keep it from drying out. Uh, the nerves that allows us to balance ourselves. These nerves are affected early, the autonomic nervous system. And so one of the first signs of nerve damage is drying of the skin and cracking of the skin, simply because the autonomic nerves responsible for creating the secretions or the oils to moisten our skin is no longer available. The next set of nerves that are affected are the sensory nerve. We call this sensory neuropathy. And this simply means that we lose feelings in our feet, first in our feet, and also can happen in our hands. And that progress in a glove and stocking manner. So it started at the toes and progressively goes across the foot, then up the ankle, and then up the calf. That's the kind of sensory neuropathy, um, how it develops. 
And so when we lose feeling in our, in our feet, then we can feel if we get an injury to our foot. The next set of nerves to be affected is what we call motor nerves. The most that the nerves that help us move, that helps the joint to move, that helps the ankle to bend, that helps the, the toe to raise. And when these are affected, these nerves are affected, we end up in neuropathy. And this, this leads to something else. This leads to abnormal foot mechanics. So if we can't feel anything and we can't move our ankle, though we start walking funny. But you know, our bodies are so good. We compensate. Our bodies compensate for a long time. But the process of compensating create bad things or causes bad things to happen because we have to shift the way our foot um, stand or the way we stand and the way we walk and the way we balance and this affects the bottom of the feet and so the feet start getting calluses and abnormal um, skin changes the joints are severely or significantly affected when you have neuropathy you have reduction in the range of mo range of motion and so when you're supposed to walk with your feet bent all the way it doesn't happen it bends halfway, and so now we develop an ulcer. When your toe's supposed to be straight, the, the, the nerves pull the toes in like uh, and, and causes it to bend, and bending of the toes and exposing the tip of the toes to pressure causes a problem. So because of the neuropathy, we get maladaptive structural and functional processes happening, and this causes our gait or the way we walk to become inefficient, we can't accommodate or we can't appreciate the ground beneath us and around us. And so it changes the way we balance and the way we weight bear. And then sometimes we go and think, oh, it's the shoes that we wear. And so we're going to change our shoes and then start wearing slippers. And then all of a sudden you realize you're walking barefooted and leave your slippers behind. That happens. So nerve injury leads to foot poor foot mechanics, and this leads to deformities of the foot because the soft tissue, the ligaments, the tendons are all affected. And you end up with undue mechanical stresses in places that are not normally exposed to, to, to trauma. Why else, why is diabetes so, um, so devastating? Diabetes is, is, is devastating because it affects the circulation and it affects the circulation because it causes atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis to develop much faster than normal. In a study we done at Princess Margaret Hospital, we showed that a diabetic at 65 and a non-diabetic, there was a 10 year difference in the presentation. So if you're a diabetic at 55, sorry, you, 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 your, your vasculature is as if you were 65 years old without diabetes. And so that's what diabetes or uncontrolled diabetes do to your circulation. It causes abnormal, or we call dyslipidemia, right? And this dyslipidemia causes cholesterol uh, or ab bad cholesterol to deposit into the blood vessel and this blood vessel is affected and get closer and closer. So atherosclerosis in the normal, um, in, in, in diabetics, causes the blood vessel to lose its protective mechanisms that is responsible for normal function. And the cholesterol, particularly the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, is the major contributor to this. We end up with microangiopathy. This is small vessel disease. And then you end up with macroangiopathy, which is large vessel disease. And so the, some of the effects that you see from small vessel disease are the, the things that you see in the eyes and in the kidneys and in the brain. And then in the larger, larger vessel, or sorry, in the toes and in the larger vessels, you have the, the legs and the abdomen uh, and on the neck and all those things being affected. Sorry about, sorry about this busy diagram, but this busy diagram just relates diabetes the, in the protective factors and the way those protective factors are lost because of hyperglycemia and abnormal cholesterol, and they lead to 
vascular complications, micro and macro angiopathy in the legs and the kidneys and in the eyes. Now, for most of us, if you look at the, the, the picture to, to, the, to my right, over time, atherosclerosis develop, and this chart shows that atherosclerosis start to develop in your early teenage life. And sometimes it takes years and years to develop, to build up to a point where it causes obstruction in the vessel. Now, this doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens um, to a certain group of people, okay? But over time, the vessels get narrowed, and as the vessels get narrowed, they get calcified, and the calcification or the calcium ruptures and causes a blood clot to develop. And this is what that blood clot look, look like close, close up. And is this unstable plaque or this ruptured plaque or this atherosclerosis with all this cholesterol and platelets that causes us to have a heart attack, causes us to have stroke, causes us to have kidney disease, causes us to have eye disease, causes us to have limb disease. Again, atherosclerosis, neuropathy, all combined, come together, causes abnormal foot mechanics, causes us to have abnormal motion in our feet, uh, structural uh, integrity. It causes calluses to develop. We end up with uh, ulcer, to ulcer get infected, infection leads to ischemia, and certainly leads to limb loss. So all of these charts that I put here, they connect what, what I speak about earlier. And so at the end of the day, in a, when we have neuropathy and we have abnormal foot mechanics and abnormal structural integrity of the foot, we end up with poor wound healing because white blood cells can't function if the blood, if the, if the sugar, if the glucose in the blood is too high. We end up with poor immune function and because if the white cell can't function, they can't initiate the immune response. We end up with metabolic derangements. Um, besides the sugar being off, everything else is going to be off. We end up with poor, the poor wound healing. The wounds can't heal. You end up with infections. You end up with gangrene. You end up with limb loss and eventually life loss if we have to take no control of this. And this is the same thing again. Uh, same thing again. So what about access to diabetic foot care? On the 14th of November, the world celebrated World Diabetes Day. And this was a day that we draw attention to the ramages or the, or, of diabetes. And we recognize that access to diabetes care is not equal across the board. And so the WHO wanted to bring attention to the fact that access to diabetes care need to be something that we need to do now because the effects and ravages of, of diabetes on the world population is enormous. So when we talk about access, we have to talk about availability. We have to talk about accessibility. We have to talk about affordability and we have to talk about acceptability. If the service is available, it should be easily accessible. And in our, it, we, ha, we already know that we are uh, a disadvantage because of the amount of water that are surrounding us on a, uh, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we are spread out across miles and miles of, of the sea. And so accessibility is an, is, an, is an issue. Not everybody have access to all the care necessary to take, to take care of a, of, a, of a diabetic foot. The, the the care is not always available in all the places equally and it's expensive we already uh, we already attribute one third of the healthcare budget to just take care of diabetic limbs imagine what we have to spend to take care of the eye disease and the strokes and the heart attacks and everything else the the, the kidney disease and the dialysis it is costly and it is in some respects unaffordable in many respects. 
And so when we create, when we have to, we have to create, we have to find ways to create, create equal access to diabetic foot care by the policies that are enacted. We have to find low cost or free insurance coverage to ensure that access and, of, and, 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 uh, and availability is equal in all seg the sectors of our society. We have to make, we have to create outreach programs. We have not developed screening programs or risk stratification programs for people with diabetes, yet people who are potential diabetics. We have poor access to green spaces for leisure and for exercise because exercise is very, very important. We don't have affordable, nutritious food that everybody can access on an equal basis. We have a lot of environmental hazards, in particular, unclean water or unsafe drinking water. And the studies have shown that this has contributed to the development and complications associated with diabetes. And certainly, I must bring to the attention that our workforce is severely depleted for patient, for people, for the professionals needed to care for diabetes. We'll talk about the workforce a little later. What about the rationale for treatment? The reason why we treat patients with diabetes is because of the significant amount of morbidity or the sickness or the complications that it causes. Diabetes already contributes to cardiovascular um, illnesses and death, and cardiovascular disease across the world is the number one reason people die. And if we don't get control of diabetes, we will continue to contribute to that number increasing. We must control glucose. And that's one of the rationales for treating is we need to control our glucose. In, in controlling glucose, we delay or prevent all the complications that ensue from elevated or persistent elevation in, 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 in glucose and diabetes development. And then we have to treat the complications, all the complications associated with, associated with diabetes. In particular, when we look at the foot, we have to manage the wound. We have to manage the foot. With managing the wound, I mean, if the if it's a simple wound, you, it it may it may require a simple treatment. But if it's a complex wound that's infected and is gangrenous and needs um, surgical intervention or something more than a uh, 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 um, a home care, then we need to be able to manage that. So we have to manage the wounds and we have to manage the wounds early, uh, effectively and efficiently so that we wouldn't progress to um, worsening conditions. And after we manage the wound, then we have to manage the foot because we know these patients with diabetes, they have abnormal structure on their foot and they have abnormal mechanics. And so we have to manage those. We have to be able to make some kind of corrections to, do, to those abnormalities that, that develop because of diabetes. And then we have to manage the limb because if, if there is there is a, a, a continue, continue, continuum sorry, um, from the foot up the leg to the limb. And we have to be able to manage this. And then we have to manage the patient as a total patient and not as a as an ulcer. We have to manage the patient because they have other comorbidities and other conditions and social and other things going on that need to be managed. And certainly we want to contribute to less people dying from diabetes. It takes a team, ladies and gentlemen, it takes a team to treat diabetes. This is no one man thing. This is no 10 man thing. It takes a team. The team may be 20 different um, professionals. It may be 20, um, 20 different professional groups, but no one group can can manage this this disease or this entity that affects everybody, uh, that everywhere in the body. So in wrapping up, I want to highlight one, that diabetes and epi is an epidemic across the globe. We at home are no different from the folks in the region or anywhere else. We have the, already have the highest amount of diabetes, sorry, diabetes in the region. We have the highest hypertension level in the region, the highest obesity in the region. We eat too much. We give ourselves too much energy and our lifestyles are not conducive to good health. We need to do something about that. Diabetes affects the entire body. The complications are profound and can be devastating. It has a significant impact on our way of life. 
So creating better access is crucial to making any type of inroads into the burden created by diabetes. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes a team. When we save a limb, we save a life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pakistan. I know we have a lot of questions um, that we want to ask. I don't know if Dr. Lopez is still on the line. Like I said, he's the representative for Dr. Johnson in his absence. Um, Dr. Lopez, are you still there? I know you had a quick presentation you wanted to share with us. We will welcome that at this time. If you're yes, I, I am. Yes, I am right here. Listen okay, to perfect. Dr. Ferguson. Yes, after Dr. Ferguson talked, nobody had nothing to put in. No, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Great Do you presentation. Have a presentation to share? No, no. Um, what I want to talk is just more about the in the diabetes education. I will have to put the camera. You can see. It. Yes, um, see the camera don't go, so that's okay. Um, we was talking more about the diabetes education, about food care. Um, how important is how to manage the blood sugar as the part of the, the diabetes food care? So, um, we recommend that all the patients that already have diabetes that at least as the standard of care, they get once a year a, a regular or annual food examination for the primary doctor or the podiatric find out what is the reason that is they supposed to come. Um, in the in the thing, how doctors say that we have to have the different um, groups that we say the education, we have a group for talk about the deformity group to take care of the vascular. Um, in our case, with all the patients that we see they have any issues with the vascular support, we send to Dr. Ferguson. Um, but we still want to be more preventive. We want to uh, teach the patient how to take care of the food, how to eat better, how to exercise, how to manage the stress, everything that's relating with the high level of sugar to prevent that the patient develop any, any ulcer. Dr. Lopez, are you Yes, you there? can hear me? Yes. Yes. I don't know if you what get cut. Is, did you get cut out or you were done speaking? I was still speaking, but I hear some children talking in the in the in the background. That's okay. What okay. I say is like um we were trying to do more in the education for patients. Um if there is any patient that need any any um, feedback about nutrition, the exercise, uh, stress management to help with the food care, we we are open to to answer the question after they the Dr. Ferguson uh, take the answer for the question about the presentation for him. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. So we'll just jump right into the QA session of the of the meeting. One thing I want to say, Dr. Ferguson, you have certainly shared a whole lot of information. Um, I must say we, and I know I'm guilty of it myself in that, you know, we always get consumed and worried about, um, cancers and, and heart attacks, um, listening to your presentation, looking at the graphics and all the statistics you provided. It seems as though I need to be cons more concerned about diabetes at this point, considering the morbidity rate for diabetes. But I know one of the questions that was placed in the chat was, would there be a cure for diabetes? Has there been any research, anything of that nature, Dr. Fakerson, you could um, um, guide us with that? Well, research for diabetes is ongoing and it, 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 it comes from many different aspects from medical management to surgical management. Um, uh, and, and so uh, even, even uh, epidemiological studies 
um, look into diabetes. Um, so if the if, if there's a cure, I, I can't say that there's a I cannot say that there's a cure on the horizon. However, I think the biggest focus should be on prevention. If we could prevent becoming a diabetic, um, then we we will we will um, be a, a whole lot better. You know, an ounce, of ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Um, and the reason, the reason, um, prevent we should we should focus on prevention is because the the when diabetes damage the organ, most of the organs cannot regenerate themselves, and so because they cannot regenerate the, themselves, you have an a, an effect that is lasting, and so if you could prevent the organs from being permanently damaged. And then you could prevent, uh, and, uh, and 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 so then we will be better at managing um and the diabetes. And so the short answer is no, there are no cure, and the long answer is prevention is better than cure. So, I totally agree, and even the old saying says a uh, pound of how's it go? <laughs> Ounce of prevention is better than, better a, pound than a pound of, of cure. cure. That indeed, um. Based on your experience, um, I'm certain you have seen a lot of amputations in the public hospital as well as uh, private hospital. Um, on average, what would you say um, our amputation rates are in the Bahamas annually? Um, that's, this is a this is a this is a really tough question, um, um, because. Um, when we when we do a lot of amputations, it points negatively to our healthcare system, <laughs> and 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 it's a sad thing. Uh, we did a we did a, a study a couple of years ago, um, and we look at uh, five years. I I I returned home in two thousand and five, and the five years before that, we had almost five hundred amputations. And in the five years, that's uh, annually. And then the five, my first five years, we had we had made a significant impact. Uh, we we dropped this almost by eighty or ninety percent to like probably less than fifty a year. And then this is slowly creep back up again. And that's simply because of the there's so there's so much factors that go in to determining why our amputation rates have, have gone back up. Um, but we um some somewhere between a hundred and two hundred amputations a year um, annually now. Wow. And, and and I could imagine is is there any I mean because it's 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 hard trying to when you have to break the news right to tell somebody that hey you're gonna lose you're gonna lose a toe much less a foot or you know your lower extremities and you mentioned there being a it being a multidisciplinary approach. During that time, when you're considering the treatment option of an amputation, is there any psychiatrist or psychologist that is on the team that's available to do counseling? You know, because I I think of it as for patients in our in in our oncology cases when they have to lose the breast, you're actually losing a part of your body, and you know, persons do struggle with body dysmorphic issues. So, do we provide that? counseling sometimes i can imagine the window is pretty narrow um in terms of it being an emergency especially if it's a gangrenous state um but do we offer that service as well for our clients that have reached that stage in their treatment yeah for the most part um we we we, we tend to try and have a multidisciplinary approach to the care of the diabetes that to, to the care of the diabetic unfortunately our system is not designed as with a tame concept in in totality and so remember the psychiatrists are up at Sunderland's and so we have to wait until they come over the PMH to offer that service but we do offer that service most times I can't say a hundred percent of the times but in most times and and and, and the the, the, uh, the Ms. Bonamy the problem that we have is many of the patients present in extremis they present with a foot that is already dead or they present with a foot that has little life in it, um, and it might as well be dead. And it, it's again speaks to our education. It speaks to our healthcare system. It speaks to so many things. I, I spoke. I mentioned briefly the workforce, 
and mm -hmm. we don't have the professionals necessary. We don't have sufficient diabetic educators. We don't have sufficient dietitians. And we don't have sufficient social workers. We don't have sufficient any professional to meet the needs of diabetes across this archipelago. And I, I, I think um, we have been advocating for a diabetic team, a rapid response team, or all different type of, of diabetic team. Um, but again, we are in a socialized environment and it, it, the cost of care outweighs the, the, the national budget for healthcare. I imagine that it does. Um, and it's funny that you say that because I, I don't, I don't think when we go to career days, um, I don't think that's, that's one of the careers that are really discussed. You know, everybody say you need to be a doctor or a lawyer, but there is room for, you know, just to be a counselor, to be a social worker. These are very much relevant arms of our medical system that are very much lacking. And it's evident, as you say, when we refer to the amount of cases that we have but for persons that are diabetics, the amount of diabetic amputations, it really speaks to the failures of the system. I, I totally agree. Um, especially when we have a culture where, um, and you kind of mentioned it in your presentation earlier, where you spoke to people having a touch, you know, that's a Bahamian thing. I just have a touch of diabetes. Dr. Fakir, they ain't claiming it. <laughs> that's very cliche. Please explain what a touch of diabetes is. Either you <laughs> have it or you don't have it. What it is. <laughs> 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 I, I I think is most I I think a lot of people are in denial, denial um, yeah. and they really don't want to claim diabetes because a lot of people are aware oh. of the ramifications of diabetes and the effect it has on the body, and so people people think that if you speak it, you're gonna get it, and so they only you know they go around saying well. They only had to have a touch of diabetes. You have diabetes. I mean, you know, we have to make it plain and simple. Most pre-diabetics go on to develop diabetes. But mm -hmm. that pre-diabetics are at a point where it is reversible. The high blood glucose is reversible. But a lot of us don't want to do what it takes to reverse that. And it takes a total lifestyle change. So when you when you say because we we have persons who we have that group of people who are pre diabetic and yes it does take change people don't like change even though change is inevitable change is dynamic um people don't like change but that's for the persons who are pre diabetic a question came up in the chat about what should be done for persons that go into a diabetic coma at home. And as far as, you know, being a nurse and all my years of experience, a diabetic home is a medical emergency. So my advice would definitely be call the ambulance, get to the emergency room. And Dr. Dr. Ferguson, you could go on and elaborate with that. So so people, um, uh, patients can go into a coma for, on either end of the spectrum, whether the mm -hmm. glucose is too high or their glucose is too low. Most times it happens because it is too low. And that's simply because someone has taken the insulin um, and didn't eat, or they have such a severe infection or something else going on that they cannot get to eat. Um, uh, or, and, and the infection or whatever condition is overwhelming their system that they cannot produce any insulin to, 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 to manage or cannot produce any glucose to, to, to drive them out of the hypoglycemic state. When we when our sugars are low, our protective mechanism allows our body to urgently make glucose from its stores. And remember, I, I spoke earlier about how the immune function and there's so much dysfunction all going on in the body. And diabetes affects how how the nerves function, how you respond to that insult or how you respond to the fight or flight phenomenon. And so you can have diabetes at both ends of the spectrum. The safest thing to do if the patient is has some level of awareness is to put something sweet in the mouth and they will respond. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's that's the first thing. The second, the, but you should call a professional or call the ambulance or call somebody 
um, who can give you uh, some real good advice. Um, if they are totally comatose, you don't want to try and do nothing for them. Don't try and give them anything. But if you can put something sweet underneath their tongue or in the corners of their mouth, that'll work. Keep the airway open and wait for help. Call for help. Correct. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I had one question, one last question. If anybody else has any questions, because we're approach, approaching that seven o'clock hour, we'll encourage you to put your last questions in the chat while I uh, go through this question. You mentioned and you talked a lot about diabetes type two and all the complications, uh, you know, from wound care and it affecting, you know, multi um, organs, multiple organs and systems. Do you see the same complications in persons that suffer from diabetes type one or what we would say juvenile diabetes? Um, the, 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 the short answer is yes, but usually patients, remember the patients with type one diabetes, they have been, they have been diabetic for most of their life. And so their lifestyle is totally different from the patient who has a type two diabetes. So they're so well toned to their diabetes. They know how to, they are well educated and they know exactly what to do. Sometimes you find what I call the careless teenager who really, mm -hmm. you know, get to the point where they don't care. But certainly most type one diabetics, um, they, they are aware of their condition and they do everything to manage it prop appropriately. Now they do, sometimes end up with infections or they end up with, with 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 complications that have to be treated and for the most part these people really are the ones who present early and they manage their diabetes appropriately okay so there are some there are two questions i see in the chat and these will be the last two questions we take for this evening um can erectile dysfunction caused by diabetes be reversed? Um, well, I, I mean, you first you have to look at um, the, the severity of the erectile dysfunction and what is actually caused it. Sometimes it is caused by the nerves being damaged or sometimes it's caused by vascular. Uh, you know, you can have a vascular component or you have a nerve component and you really have to, to be assessed properly. Usually the vascular components can be reversed if if attended to properly. Um, the nerve uh, the the nerve um, causes can uh, can be supplemented with adjuncts, and the urologist will take care of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the final question for this evening is: At what stage in diabetes can the eyes be affected, particularly for drivers? Well, again, diabetes, um, in, in type, the problem with type 2 diabetes is that a lot of people present with symptoms before they are actually diagnosed. And so you can have eye problems and don't even know that you are diabetic. And so sometimes we, um, we, we, we throw it off as, oh, I need new glasses or um, depression, my, uh, you know, my head hurts. And so... Um, at any point in time, your eyes could be affected, even if you don't have a diagnosis. And a lot of people present with eye problems and get a diagnosis because they present. What we need to do, and like one of the access to care is we need to, to, to make sure that outreach programs uh, equal across the board. Everybody have access to an outreach program where they can be screened, where they get a proper eye testing, where they can have their limbs or toes tested, where they can have um, their, their heart tested. You know, they, there are there are specific things that, that screening can identify. And if we get a screening program where we can identify these early things, then we would be better at managing the complications uh, if they develop um, once we once we are diabetic. Thank you, Dr. Farkasen. We'll now turn it over to Ms. Hensia Pinder that's going to close us out with the vote of thanks. Good evening again, everyone. On behalf of Mr. Charlene Rogers, our Vice President for Bahama Health, our Dog Talk Committee, and the entire Bahama Health family, we would like to extend our gratitude to you, Dr. Parkinson and Dr. Lopez, for such an impactful presentation. Um, 
although I'm not a diabetic, you, you guys provided a lot of information um, on preventative measures. And, um, you know, we never know what life is going to throw at us. So even if it doesn't affect us, this is a great wealth of knowledge to provide with anybody that, that we encounter that can find this information quite benefit beneficial. And so we just want to say thank you, because we do know that your time is precious. So we thank you for taking your time to join us this evening. And to you, our guest, we thank you so much for your attendance and for your participation um, and joining us on our Doc Talk this evening. 